the 100th Great War breaks out. The colonial army kicked out of Orbreaker, Marbon Hollow and Endless Shore. Not so long ago, the Warden Army was in a terrible state. Morale was very low and many regiments were seriously understaffed. But it seems those dark days are behind us now. Kaueva is not dead and it made it known through the dazzling results that our army has recorded in recent days. Many veterans of previous wars have returned to pass on their knowledge to young recruits, who are also very present in our ranks. Large-scale operations have been undertaken, restoring strong morale to the soldiers of the empire. To the west, the CSU, 14Ls, ZMP, Ronin, GE, 30-13 wage a victorious campaign on Fisherman's Row, while a regrouping of WV, FIN, ARG, 27th, Hock, V and 82DK saved the town of Maiden's Vale from a dangerous siege and drove the assailants back to Drowned Vale. Sundial made an honourable lead at Faranak Coast as well. Success was also on the agenda towards Endless Shore where the 11 Ursi, the 3rd, the Frogs, the Arsian, the BR and many others left from Saltbrook Channel to arrive at the borders of Alod's Bight. The groups in the east are not left out either, they fought like lions to take and hold the city of the Rush. However, the game is not won in advance. The colonial army has in its ranks many experienced and combative fighters. The Legion's powerful coalitions have proven time and time again that they can regain the initiative through skillful tactical and strategic maneuvering. The challenge is great and this war will surely be very interesting. Back to status quo. Two landing fleets meet on the open sea. Amphibious operations are dangerous operations that require substantial logistics, great organization but above all an absolute discretion. The success or failure of such an operation depends on the ability to spot an enemy fleet early enough. But what happens when the secret manages to be kept? A few days ago, an unlikely situation happened. A warden fleet led by the KRGG and its allies departed from weathered expanse towards the Fingers to land troops there. As it approached the southern border of Tempest Island, it came across in complete surprise a colonial fleet made up of barges and a white whale displaying the KSR flag probably on its way to land near Liar's Heaven. On both sides, people remained speechless, incredulous in front of a situation that had never happened before. The hesitation persists for a few seconds before the clash begins. A real naval battle then ensues. But fate will have the last word. Gigantic waves then form and cause many crews to go overboard, unable to defend their ships. This is what happened to the helmsman of the colonial white whale who was unable to protect his building from warden attacks, victim of something beyond him. The colonial fleet is thus routed by elements over which no one has control. After this incredible encounter, the warden fleet continued on its way to its second man objective where the landed forces were able to hold their bridgehead for four hours before evacuating. Old veterans of both sides were astonished by this event. None of them was able to remember a similar event in the past, making this encounter the absolute first one in Kaueva history. Back to movement war. Flank them all. After the stalemate of the previous weeks, the arrival of siege artillery and heavy armor seems to have put the war definitively into a much more active phase where the ownership of objectives located along the front change every hour. This is also the time when the infantry formations show all their strategy by succeeding in terrorizing the toughest armored vehicles thanks to skillful flank movements. As usual, the fighting in the Deadlands region is proving to be incredibly violent with no less than 503,000 soldiers put out of action on both sides. The colonial army is well established in the region but struggles to bring down the last warden stronghold at Callahan's Gate where the garrison throws all its forces into battle to hold the ground it has left. This part of the front being definitively blocked, it is necessary to find other ways to hope to defeat the enemy. The Warden Army thus engaged in a vast pincer movement by launching major offensives in the far west and far east of Kaueva. While we are ritting those lines, the Warden Army has established a foothold in Sanctuary in Westgate while the Colonial Army has regained control of the town of the Routed in the Fingers region. The fighting is at its peak as super heavy tanks, atle tanks, and perhaps ballistic weapons enter the scene. Neither side has said its last word and will commit all the forces at its disposal. Back to the stalemate. The incredible evacuation of Dunkirk SHT. For several days, new armored monsters have appeared on the battlefield. 
Super heavy tanks promised devastating power that would shift the balance of power across an entire front with their mere presence. However, on the colonial side, the operational performance of the 0-75BRs proved to be very disappointing in view of its logistical cost, to the point that it was almost banned from the battlefield, only very rare copies being produced. It is not the same for the Cullen Predator MK. 3 which has proven its ability to clear a whole battlefield provided it is very well escorted by lighter tanks and infantry. This glaring imbalance gives the capture or destruction of a predator immeasurable prestige within the colonial army which has managed to destroy a number of them. But not this time. While the LLERC regiment launched an offensive on the town of Iron Junction by sending several flood MK. Iron a predator, the colonial artillery managed to destroy the bridge of bathed landing, depriving the armored column of any retirement. Cornered on the edge of the river and under the intense pressure of colonial tanks determined to destroy the Colossus, the men of the 11th RC then decided to go all in by evacuating the Predator by the still intact railway bridge. The insane maneuver lasted about 10 minutes during which the tank almost ended up at the bottom of the water. The precise progression, the reinforcement of two Aquatipper barges as well as the meticulousness of the 11 RC pilots made the feat possible despite an extremely unfavorable context. The audacity paid off and the Predator, renamed Dunkirk for the occasion, returned safe and sound to our lines. Body count reaches 5 millions. The fall of Callahan's Gate unleashes the colonial army. Since the town of Callahan's Gate was reduced to ashes, victim of a ballistic strike, ending an 827-day resistance by the 27th and their allies, the situation has deteriorated bluntly. The city itself catalyzed a large part of the seasoned troops of the colonial army who are now free to spread out on the other's fronts, and in particular on the western side where the setback is the most severe. Fisherman's Row, Westgate, Lynn of Mercy and much of Faranac Coast were lost while bridgeheads were established in Callahan's Passage and Marbon Hollow. To the east, the situation is more stable, with southern endless shore and Tempest Island changing sides several times per day. It is another face shown by the colonial army which seemed to suffer from the conflict a few weeks ago and which now makes the toughest of our soldiers doubt the outcome of the conflict. Added to this is a sad record that has just been broken. The Green Cross has indeed made public the information that the record figure of 5 million deaths was exceeded a few days ago. A macabre first in the history of Cowiva as the war seems far from over and the counter continues to rise. When this war will ever end? What happened at Mercy's Whale? If you follow the news of the conflict, it is impossible that you have not heard of this event as it will have caused so many ink, tears, and blood to flow. Last week, the Warden Army launched a ballistic strike on the town of Mercy's Whale to fulfill two purposes, to cripple colonial supply lines on the eastern front by destroying the town seaport and to use the rocket stationed at the site of Evil Eye to prevent its capture by the colonial army which was already bombarding the site. But things didn't go as planned. From the promontory to the southeast of the city, a large warden contingent deployed to protect the observer throughout the transmission process of the firing coordinates. Under the supervision of the many senior officers present, he thus fulfilled his role under the fire of the colonial artillery. But unexpectedly, the rocket does not fall at the targeted location but on the coastal rocks of the promontory, instantly killing the wardens and colonial soldiers close to the explosion. The confusion is total. What happened? Was there a spotting error by the observer? Did the rocket suffer a malfunction in flight? Nothing is certain right now. The observer claims to have correctly carried out the procedure dictated by the officers present. Many testimonies and likely explanations have reached us both from warden and colonial sides, but these remain only hypotheses. The ongoing investigation has not delivered its results and it is likely that we will never know what really happened. What is certain, however, is that contrary to what colonial propaganda has long affirmed through numerous sometimes very amusing press releases, the rocket never fell into the sea in front of the city. This can be seen by the presence of the still visible crater, on the rock near the city. You can see the crater photographed by our team below. 
anyone can therefore go there and and see for themselves the site of the impact. Despite this unexplained failure, the Warden Command decided to fire a second rocket which fell near the seaport as planned. This launch with heavy consequences is added to the strikes of Old Captain, Callahan's Gate and the aborted attempt on Sitaria which have all been strongly criticized, further exacerbating the already serious tensions due to the exceptional duration of the conflict which today reaches its 1,200th day. The colonial army has now resumed its march toward north but the warden defenses still remain tenacious despite strained nerves. The official death count has now went over 6 millions with already 3 millions for the warden army alone. This conflict is historic and will certainly leave a mark on all the men and women who took part in it. In the face of so much horror and drama, will this war be the one that will put an end to all wars? The end of a historic conflict. Warden Army achieve its last stand at White Walk. No one thought to see the end of it. And yet, exhausted by 1338 days of war, the two belligerents finally signed a total cessation of fighting, the Warden Army capitulating unconditionally to the power of the Colonial Legion. Morally and physically broken, the surviving men and women of the Warden Army were welcomed as heroes by the people of Weddens Row as they proved that even in defeat, Warden soldiers fight until the end. This observation was crystallized by the ultimate operation of the Warden Army a landing on the beaches of weathered expanse with all the remaining equipment in military stockpiles. This operation was not intended to repel the colonial army but rather to show that although weakened, the Warden Army was still in a condition to fight. A kind of ultimate challenge to the Legion for honor. The city of White Walk was thus able to be captured and defended for several days against the incessant counterattacks of an enemy eager to end the war. Partisan units have even managed to infiltrate the axe head and scrying belt compounds to sabotage as much material as possible. On their sides, the cities of Ogmaran and Tyne also resisted heroically for days, despite the catastrophic situation. But still, here we are. This war, the longest that Kaueva has ever known, the most trying that the oldest veterans have known, the deadliest in all history, is finally over. The Green Cross reports are terrifying. Both sides have more than 6,500,000 dead and missing, many of whom will only be buried in the shredded and scorched soil of Kaueva. A whole generation is marked by this conflict which will have required an incalculable number of sacrifices but which will also have seen painful, hilarious and unusual events. While Kaueva slowly begins to heal its wounds, some hope that the horror and excess of this war will make it the famous, war that will end all wars but others are hardly fooled by this statement and know that the end of conflict sows the seeds of a greater cataclysm to come.